All right. We are live. Okay. Good evening. Welcome to EdTech's family webinar on all of APS tools. My name is Shel Marie Harris. I'm the Executive Director of Educational Technology. And let me introduce my Senior Director, Aaron Jaramillo. Hi, folks. Aaron Jaramillo, Senior Director of Educational <laughs> Technology. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight and share some of the resources that we put together at the district and, and uh, learn a little bit about what we can do to support you. So I'm going to introduce my team and I'm going to start off first by uh, introducing, I'm going to kind of go around uh, Mr. Karn Gustafson. Um, he's our resource, uh, EdTech resource teacher, Ms. Kristen Garlitz, um, Ms. April Ricard, and Ms. Tina Nunez. So with that said, we are going to get started here. And I'm going to leave. I just want you guys to really do, to point out that we're going to post some information. Um, so we're going to hold, we're going to have some banners in between each of us. Um, that's going to give you a short link to answer questions. So the web address is rebrandly.ly or rebrand.ly forward slash family hyphen questions. So we're going to post that in the chat. So if you want to ask questions in the live, in the, uh, while this is going on, um, we encourage that. And with no further ado, I'm going to kick it over to Karn to get started. So thanks, Aaron. First thing we wanted to talk to you about tonight was YouTube closed captioning and auto translate. So here you'll see we are on the Educational Technology YouTube channel. This channel has lots of resources for teachers as well as students. If you click here on playlist, you will find that we have a playlist specifically for students. If I view this playlist, you'll see we currently have seven videos set up for students with more to come. Let's choose a video here and open that up. In this video, you have the option right here for closed captioning as well as settings. When I turn closed caption on, they're automatically set to English. Open up settings. If you want these closed captions to be in a different language, it's really simple now, thanks to this new addition by YouTube. Click on the settings icon and that opens up your subtitles. You see they're automatically created in English. Select that and you can choose auto translate. With auto translate, you see we have lots and lots of languages. We're gonna go ahead and choose Spanish for this option. Click play. And now you automatically have your closed captioning in Spanish. Not gonna be perfect, but it works pretty well in most cases. Any slang terms or accents may affect the way this closed captioning works, but a great tool for you to be aware of as we go on. Doesn't work on live streams, but it will work in all recorded videos. Thanks a lot, and I'm gonna hand it back to Aaron. All right, folks, so that was the first part. Karn's going to go over another section here. Just remember that we're posting a rebrandly link. Um, you'll see the rebrandly link pop up in the chat if you have any questions along the way. Uh, please post your question there, and we're going to collect them and answer them at the end. But what? What, Karn? You want me to do it? I, I thought you said Aaron was taking this section. No, it's me. Okay, all right, so ladies and gentlemen, let's talk a little bit about Google Chrome and the Chrome browser. Here I'm in the Google Chrome browser and you can see in this upper right hand corner that I am logged into Chrome. Logging into Chrome is gonna be very important because it ensures that everything is going to sync up properly. So to log into Chrome, you would click in this upper right hand corner and you would sign in. Now here you can see that I'm already signed in. And then the most important part is right here where it says sync is on. You always want to make sure that you're syncing your Google account because that takes everything together and creates uh, a cohesive program so that all of your Google apps are logging in as well. The login for your Chrome account is the same as it is for Classroom or any of your other Google apps. So it's your ID number at aps.edu with the appropriate password. 
once you've synced, then you should automatically be logged into the Google app. So here you can see I'm in the Google app and I am logged in here. This is your program icon. This is your Chrome icon. They should match if everything's logged in appropriately. With that done, once you're here in Google, you've got your Google Apps Manager. Sometimes we call it the waffle. And inside of here are all of your Google Apps. All right. The order that your apps are in may vary depending upon what you've used most frequently. But from in here, I can click into anything like Google Classroom. And here I can see all of the classrooms I'm part of. I have everything like even Jamboard and the other apps which are all working together. Again, very important and we highly recommend using Google Chrome because that browser is gonna help pull everything together. So kind of wrapping things up, please make sure that you're always logged into your Chrome browser as well as into the Google suite or the G suite of tools to ensure that everything is gonna mesh up really nicely and then you can use everything here. All right, I'm gonna hand it off to Kristen who's gonna go over some different hardware tools with you. All right, Kristen, it's all yours. Hi, this is how to use a Chromebook. Step one is to turn on your Chromebook. The power button may be located on the side of your Chromebook or it may be located on the top. In the top right corner might also be a lock button that you can use to lock your computer when you walk away. The next step is to log into your Chromebook. The first time you log in, you will need to use your student Gmail account and password to log in. Remember, your student email account is your student ID at aps.edu and your password is your initials dot birth date. All students kindergarten through 12th grade now have active Gmail accounts. Your username and password are the same for logging in to your Chromebook as logging into your Gmail. Any other time after the first login, you will just need your password. If you need to switch accounts, click on the time at the bottom right screen, click on your username, then click sign out. Then click on the add person button and enter the new username and password. The next step is to choose your home internet network. You will need to select your home internet and connect to it. Click on the time, then click on networks. Search for your home internet and click on it. Click connect and type in the password. You can also choose to automatically remember this network, so you'll always connect to it. The next step is using the mouse trackpad. Use single click, or thud to select something using the trackpad. Use a two finger click or thud to right click. Use two fingers to scroll up and down on a screen or two fingers side to side to switch screens or tabs. The next step is knowing how to use your keyboard. Here is some basics about how a Chrome keyboard is set up. The magnifying glass opens App Launcher so you can search for an app or search the web. The arrows go to previous pages or the next page in a browser. This arrow here reloads a current page. This button opens one page in full screen mode. The multiple screens button is for switching to your next window. These two are for increasing or decreasing brightness. These two are for increasing and decreasing volume and the mute button, and the power button or the lock button will be located here. Next is using keyboard shortcuts. There are a lot of keyboard shortcuts that you can use to quickly complete common tasks. Some of the most popular keyboard shortcuts are Control C to copy, Control V to paste, Control X to cut, Control A to select all, Control Z to undo. Use Control N to open a new window and Control T to open a new tab. 
Use Control Alt Question Mark to open the Shortcuts menu to see the rest of the shortcuts. To take a screenshot, use Control Screen Button or Control Shift Screen Button to select a size of a screenshot. Then you can copy to the clipboard in order to paste it somewhere. Use Alt Bracket to move your screen to the right or left half for split screen. The next step is accessing testing apps. Students, you will all have testing apps pre-installed on your Chromebooks. You will not need these apps unless your teacher tells you it is time to take a test. To access these apps, you will need to log out of your Chromebook. Then the apps menu will appear in the bottom left corner. High school and elementary students will have slightly different apps installed. Special education and English language development students may have different testing apps The next step is accessing apps. The menu at the bottom here is called the shelf. You can click on the apps linked here to go directly to those apps. The apps launcher is the circle in the bottom left corner. You can click in the search box and type in what you would like to search for. It can take you to apps or search the web. You can also click this arrow to go up to see all of the apps you have downloaded. There's a tiny circle menu on the right if you have multiple screens worth of apps. You can pin an app by right-clicking on it and choose Pin to Shelf. This will make the app show up on the shelf for quick access. An important app you might need is the camera or video app. Click on the app's launcher, then click on the camera button. Take a picture by clicking on the round gray button. You can also switch to video mode to take a video. Click on the thumbnail to view recent pictures and videos. You can add photos and videos to Google Drive by clicking Print, then clicking Save to Drive, then click Save. Unfortunately, students do not have access to print from a Chromebook. The pictures and videos are saved long-term in the Files folder Click on the Apps Launcher, click on Files, and go to Images. All of your images and screenshots will be saved here. To close the Apps Launcher, you can close any of the apps that are open or click on the circle button again. Next step is using Chrome. Click here to go to Google Chrome to search the internet. Your home screen may be google.com or it may be my.aps.edu. If not, this is a great place for students to start. Log in to my.aps.edu using your student ID and password. The next thing you can do is access your Google tools. You should already be logged into Google since you are logged into your Chromebook. To check, click on your icon in the top right corner and check that it says your student email address and name. Then you can access your Google app, apps by clicking on the, Apple's, the apps waffle menu in the top right corner. Scroll down to see all of your apps in the Google suite. Use the Google Drive to save all of your uh, documents and pictures and everything else. The Chromebook has very limited storage. And just so you know, student accounts have filters blocking certain websites and search words when searching the web. The next step is using your settings icon. In the bottom right corner, click the time. You can change the volume or brightness of your Chromebook. You can click on the Wi-Fi button to troubleshoot Wi-Fi issues or change networks. You can click the gear icon to see more settings. You can also turn on accessibility by clicking the accessibility button. Turn on Chromevox to have the computer read what you click. Turn on select to speak to have the computer read text you select. Turn on dictation to have the computer type what you say. Turn on full screen magnifier to magnify the screen. 
and turn on large mouse cursor to get a larger mouse. All right, thanks, Kristen. Um, we're going to, again, remember if you want some more information on Chromebooks, you can always visit the video, uh, come back to the video, check it out. And now we're going to turn it over to April to talk a little bit about iPads. In order to get the most out of our iPad, it's extremely important to understand how it functions and how buttons work. So here you have on the front of your iPad, you have a multi-touch display, which means your device, the surface on the front, allows multiple points of touch to operate it. And at the bottom you have the home button and the home button is essential in you know waking your your iPad or taking a screenshot or pressing it two times to navigate in between apps. That's a really important button there. And then of course on the bottom you have your two speakers. On the backhand side of your iPad you have the volume buttons to the right on the side volume up and volume down. You have your camera, your sl sleep and wake up buttons and your microphone is located on the top back and you have your headphone jack. And that's important because a lot of kids do better and are more focused when they have headphones located in their device. And at the bottom there is your lightning jack where you will plug in your iPad to allow it to charge. One of the main things that I really wanted to talk about is your iOS version. And what that means is what software version is your iPad running. There are two different versions that we have out in our community right now. So we have one that's iOS 12.4.8 and we have another one that's running iOS 13.7. And the way that you can figure out which iPad uh, software yours is running is to open up your iPad, tap settings, and tap general. Once you tap general, if you tap about, then you will see a screen that has your software version. This is important because different apps behave differently in different iOS versions. It's extremely important that you keep your iPad up to date and running properly, and that includes software updates. You can toggle on automatic updates so that anytime your iPad is connected to Wi-Fi and it's charging, it will go ahead and automatically update for you. All right, folks. Thank you, April. Um, just remember that I'm going to keep flashing up the question short link. So if you have any questions, um, go ahead and post them at that link. So I'll show you that real quick before we get into the next. To add apps to your APS iPad, go ahead and navigate towards the app catalog. App catalog looks like this red apple, the APS logo. I'm just going to select that. And then you'll see all the apps that are approved for download right here in the app catalog. If you're the app that you're looking for is not here, it's because it hasn't been vetted or approved by a APS just yet. So I'm going to install maybe Google Slides. So I'm just going to tap install tap install again, and you won't see it populate right away, but it will in just a little bit. One of the best features of the iPad is the accessibility tools. And accessibility is just design that is built for everyone. And these tools are so important for your student and for our learners that uh, I guarantee you're gonna find power in them. So what you're gonna do is navigate to accessibility. On the left-hand side in the iOS 12.4.8 uh, version, you're going to find accessibility in general accessibility, and then you'll, you'll see the next screen that will have the next set of tools. In iOS 13.7, you're gonna have accessibility right within the general settings. Once you're there, the first accessibility tool that we are going to enable is spoken content. And what that means is anything that you click and highlight on your device will be read out loud. What a powerful tool, especially for our younger learners. So in order to do that, on the left-hand side, you're gonna find speech. And on the right-hand side, you're gonna find the one that says spoken content. 
Once there, we're going to toggle on the button that says Speak Selection. And what that means is when you select some text, you will have the ability to have it read out loud. While we're also in here, let's turn on Highlight Content. And what that does is as words are spoken, they are underlined or highlighted in whatever color you choose. That's so nice for any learner to be able to track their reading. And let's also turn on one of the most powerful voices within the iPad. That voice is Alex. And let me tell you why Alex is so special. Alex is the only computer voice that takes a breath in between words and also pauses after punctuation and at the end of a sentence. Let's see spoken content in action. So I'm going to go to a website that's going to have some text. So maybe I'm going to type in something like time for kids in Safari. I'm just going to tap on Safari and here's an article right here. And I'm going to select this text. To do that, I'm just going to long press and drag these little um, handles out until I select um, you know, those three sentences. And then you'll see that when I let go, I have copy, look up, speak, or share. So I'm just going to tap speak. Fall is a season of change. As the weather gets colder, acorns, apples, pumpkins, and leaves change color. Take a look. Did you notice how that voice took a breath and paused. It might not sound really human to you, but it sounds a lot better than a lot of different computer voices. So that's just one option to allow content on your iPad to be read aloud. What a powerful tool. Next set of accessibility tools is to allow dictation. And what dictation is voice to text. So whatever I say is going to be recorded and typed out for me. So in order to do that, we just need to enable our keyboard with dictation. So for this, you're gonna to go to settings, keyboard, and toggle on enable dictation. Now let's look at speech to text. I'm gonna open up notes, and this is where I already have my note that I started. I'm just gonna press return. I'm going to tap the microphone and it's going to bring up um, the ability to record my voice. Isn't dictation super cool? What a great option for students to be able to dictate their ideas instead of having to type them out all of the time. Gives just different options and that's what accessibility is all about. Another really great option is your display and your brightness settings. Those allow you to dim your screen or to brighten it up and every learner is different on what's comfortable for their eyes. You can toggle that slider to the right or to the left to increase or decrease your brightness. You can also change the text size so that it's larger or smaller depending on how you like to read things. All right, we're going to quickly go over one more tool that you might find useful with iPads in looking at what your students browsing and what how much screen time they have. So it's actually called a screen time app. So April's going to share that as well. While the district already has a certain amount of restrictions on the student iPads, you can supplement these features by using Apple's built in screen time application. So let me walk you through the steps. What screen time is, is it's an application built into your iPad that allows you to access real time reports on websites or applications and hours spent on the iPad so that you can get a, um, a really good feeling or sense of how much time your child is spending on the device after school hours. Keep in mind there's some filters that you can't bypass due to the restrictions that are placed on the iPads from the district. The first thing I'm going to do is go to settings and then you'll see over here on the left hand side you'll see screen time and I'm just going to tap turn on screen time and you'll see here you get um, a little insight about what screen time is. You can you know, get weekly reports, set a downtime, and I like to think of a downtime as kind of like a nap for your iPad. It's unusable during those hours. 
um, set additional content privacy and restrictions. Although the district already has content privacy and restrictions on there, you can set some additional um, restrictions. So let's press continue. And it says, is this an iPad for yourself or your child? And you're gonna say, this is my child's iPad. And then you can go ahead and set a downtime right here. For this part right here, this is something that you can go into a little bit more, a little bit deeper. Um, we're not gonna do that for this video, but stay tuned for additional videos that will kind of go into how you can set app limits. But we're for right now, we're just gonna press not now. All right, content and privacy restrictions. Let's just go ahead and press continue. And this is where it's gonna ask you for a four digit parent passcode. Um, I would suggest entering something that you will not forget and enter it one more time. So you can see here that I have, you know, some additional options. So now is where I can go into these and really kind of customize those more for what I would like. You know, maybe my son, you know, he, maybe he has a problem staying up past bedtime and getting on the device. So um, you can set some restrictions that at a certain time, the iPad will not be able to be used. Go ahead and set this for eight o'clock and then it'll turn back on at seven. And at downtime, you notice that it says it's going to be blocked. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave those features. And then I can go in and choose additional settings for each one. We hope this helps in you know, gathering data about how often your child is on the device outside of school hours and any websites that they're going to, you can get all of those reports real time. And that's a really important tool for parents. All right, thank you, April. Um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about Google tools. So I'm gonna hand it over to Tina. Hi, so I am Tina from the EdTech department and I am here on a brand new screen, which is google.com. I'm going to be talking about some tools that we are probably using a lot in this current situation as students. And that's going to be Google Classroom and Gmail and Seesaw. So before I start that, let's talk a little bit about G Suite for Education. All students in APS have a G Suite account, which gives them access to Google tools. So previously what Kristen and Aaron had talked about, all of students having that account. Here, I'm going to be using a fake student account. Normally it's their number at APS.edu. And when I sign into this account through Chrome, I'm gonna to go to google.com. And that is going to give me my Google account up here in the right corner. And next to it is gonna be the Google Apps Launcher. So in the Google Apps Launcher, I'm going to be finding all of those tools, which means there are different tools that Google has where students can create and collaborate on docs and spreadsheets and create presentations or even websites. So we're going to click on this and here are all of the different tools. There's Gmail, Drive, which is going to house all my files and items, Google Classroom we're going to talk about in a minute, Docs similar to Word, Excel is similar to Sheets. Google Slides is the PowerPoint sort of version that Google has. There is a calendar, a chat communication tool, Google Meet, which is how most teachers are probably meeting with students right now, and Google Sites, which allows students to create websites. There are a few more apps, but normally these are the main core of the G Suite tools. So we're gonna start with the first one today and we're gonna click on Gmail. So similar to what a student would do, I'm gonna click on that icon. And that's going to open up in my tab. Everything's going to be kept here in the cloud and everything is going to be housed right here through the browser. I'm going to go in here to Gmail. Similar to what regular Gmail is going to be the student Gmail space. It is going to be different in the fact that students can only send and respond to emails that are in the at APS.edu domain. They can't do anything outside of that space. So students can go up here and compose a message. And since this is running through at APS.edu, if students just start typing in that two bar, their teacher's name, it should automatically populate and they can just select it. They can add in a subject and a body in their email. We are asking students to make sure that they are signing their names on the bottom of their email because we don't want it to be sent off as a student number. We do know that Google Gmail etiquette is really important and we actually have a page and something to reference on our site about that. 
any unread emails are going to be bold. Emails that have been read are going to be grayed out here. Now up here, I noticed that one of these emails looks a little bit different than the other ones. It has parentheses. This is going to be an email that is going to be generated from Google Classroom. So you're going to notice there's a Google Classroom header right here. And if I go down, you're going to see that there is a reminder and information about an assignment that was created. And I can open that assignment right here from Gmail. You can access all of your emails here through the inbox, and it is very, very similar to using a regular Gmail space. Now, we will have on our student playlist on our YouTube channel some more information, as well as some more information on our website. So this is just a really brief covering of Gmail. I am going to go back to Google here, and we are going to look at getting into Google Classroom now. So Google Classroom is that learning space for teachers and students. We're going to go up to this apps launcher we previously mentioned and click on the classroom icon this time, which is going to open a Google Classroom dashboard. And there are cards for each of the classrooms that I'm enrolled in. To enroll into a classroom, students can enroll in three different ways. The first way over here on this paper I'm going to show you is a class code. Then there is a class link or teacher enrollment. Going back to the dashboard, let's look at the class code. I'm going to click on the plus sign to join a class, and students just need to add that class code right here and then click join, and that will put that classroom on that dashboard with the class cards. I'm going to go back to that page and show the class link where students need to just click on this link right here. And when they go to this link, it will automatically enroll them into that class here with this join class code right here. And that will enroll them this way. If I go back, the third option is teacher enrollment. So if I go to that classroom dashboard, if my teachers already enrolled me, all I have to do is click on this join button. Once the student is enrolled, all they have to do is click on the title and that will take them into their Google Classroom. The first page we're going to look at is the stream. This is where announcements and assignments can be posted and where students can share something with the entire class. They can write in a note right here. And they can add any of the items from their drive, links, or YouTube, and then they can post that to the class. Students can also reply to teachers or to other students. This is seen by the entire class. So it needs to be appropriate. If students are inappropriate, teachers have the ability to mute students. The middle section here is classwork. This is where students are going to be able to finish up materials, questions, or assignment work. In materials, it is where students will click on an item and they won't be able to turn it in. So if there is a material item, students only look at it. They don't need to turn it in. I'm going to go back to classwork. And the other types of assignments are questions, which have this icon, or assignments, which is a clipboard. For assignments, if a student clicks on the title of an assignment and then clicks on View Assignment, they'll be taken into the space where that assignment can be um, completed. Here are the instructions that they will need to complete. Some assignments have rubrics with further instructions. And over here, there are two ways that students can complete an assignment. One of the first ways is they can add or create something from their drive. So I'm going to move my face over. They can pull from their drive, or they can create anything new like a doc, slide, sheet, or drawing. If a teacher has already included a template, students can click on that template right here. And they will be taken to a brand new page, which will allow them to complete this. They may be completing this all together with a small group, or they can be having their own individual page to complete. This is an individual item because it has my name in front of the title of the project. And here I am able to turn in my assignment after it's been completed right from this space. Google 
does not need you to save anything. It auto saves everything. Everything is in the cloud. So students don't need to download or upload. Everything functions right through Google Classroom. I'm going to go here to turn in. And it's going to show that my work has been turned in. I can unsubmit it to make changes, but now my teacher will be able to get it inside their Google Classroom and get comments back to me. Over here, I can see the number of points that were available and what time this assignment had been appointed. I am also able to go here to my Classworks tab and I can look at my Google Calendar and see if there's any due dates for particular assignments. I can go over here as a student and go to view your work. And I'm able to see all of my items that have been turned in and all of my grades from my teacher. So going back here, let's go up here and talk about these, this main menu for all classes. And we're going to talk about Google Meets and parent information. So looking up here on these three lines, let's go over the main menu of Google Classroom. This is where students can access all of their classes, which is going to put all of those classroom cards in one spot. Here on these three lines, they can also access the classroom calendar. On the calendar, it's going to have due dates and important information from all of the classrooms that the child is enrolled in. You can filter those out through the space right here. I have a to-do widget, which if you have a child enrolled in multiple classes, this is where students can see in one space all of the assignments that are assigned from all of those classes. Any that are missing and the due date that they were supposed to be done on or completed on. And over here, they can click on done. And on all of the finished assignments that have been graded and turned in, they can see their grades. Going back to that main menu, we're going to go down all the way to the bottom to settings. In settings, students can turn off or on email notifications. So they will receive those email notifications we just talked about from their Google Classrooms. Now talking about notifications, I'm going to switch over the screen to a parent account here. And this is a parent account and the teacher has asked parent if they would like to receive email summaries from Google Classroom. So parents can receive email summaries as well. Once you receive an invite from your child's teacher, it's going to look like this, and you're going to have to accept an invite as a guardian in that Google Classroom. Once you accept, you will have the ability to toggle between the frequency of receiving emails. You can choose either weekly or daily or receiving no summaries at all. So if you had originally selected no summaries, you may need to contact your child's teacher to see if they can resend that invite. I'm gonna go here to the parent inbox and show you one of those weekly summaries. This will pull up a summary for every single classroom that that child is enrolled in. So it'll say the summary for what time period and then it will have a brief description of the activity and what was due on that day or time. And you can also see any assignments that have been marked as missing. So if you have not received that, please contact your child's teacher to have them resend that email or information to you. I'm gonna go back up here to the classes and let's talk about running a Google Meet right from Google Classroom. Right now, many Teachers are meeting with students with Google Meet, and one way that you can get there is right through the Google Classroom Classwork page, and there is a Meet icon as long as the teacher has that turned on. Now, if a child tries to go into a Meet by themselves before the teacher has started it, they will not be able to get into that Meet. So I'm going to look over to the side, and I'm going to start the Meet as a teacher. I'm going to go back to the screen and I'm going to click on that Meet tab again. And now you'll notice I'm able to join this call and my teacher's already in it. So once I am in a Meet, it's very important that a child leaves a Meet before their teacher. And we do have a Google Meet etiquette page on our website. 
um, going over some appropriate ways to be inside a Google Meet. So this is the basic, very brief overview of Google Classroom. We have a full about 15 minute training for students in how to use all of the different parts of Google Classroom. So I'm going to be sharing a different screen here in a moment to cover how to use Seesaw. So I'm going to show you how to use Seesaw very briefly. There's a couple of different ways to sign in. I'm going to go over here to my.aps.edu, which is how students can sign in on a desktop or laptop computer. They're going to sign in with their student number here at aps.edu and their password, and then click sign in. And that is going to bring up all of their apps that are available to them in ClassLink. Students are going to select the student resources folder and they will select the Seesaw app and that is going to take them into their Seesaw account. Now I'm going to switch my screen over to my iPad screen and show you what that looks like signing in on the iPad. So now I'm here on my iPad and I'm going to want to tap on the class Seesaw app. You're going to want to select I'm a student instead of using codes as previously we're going to be using the Google email sign-in for all students. We're going to want to do this because now they are all tied into the student's account. So go to sign in with Google. Their student number at aps.edu. I'm using a fake account here just to show you. And then you're going to put in their password. You're going to want to make sure students put in their password here. And then hit next. They will now be in their Seesaw class. Since students are now logging in with their Google accounts, which are tied to APS, they'll be able to go up to the top profile information and tap on it, and they can switch quickly between any of the classes that they are enrolled in. Once you have logged into Seesaw one time on an iPad with their Google accounts, they should be able to tap on that icon and open up all of those classes again without having to sign in again. I'm going to go back to my desktop here to show you Seesaw. And here are three different pages that we're going to look at on the student class. The first one is the student journal, and this is where all of the completed activities are going to be that students have completed. Students are able to add a comment on those activities, either a written or voice comment, and that will be received by the teacher. The middle page here are activities. This is where teachers are going to assign to students all of the different activities they want them to complete. To access this activity, students will click on the activity itself. They can read instructions or play them. Students will select add response and they will be able to complete the activity with all of these different tools here on this page. Students can click up here on the top to review those instructions again. They can type, add voice recordings or take pictures or add images. So photo, video, or uploading, shapes, background, or links. Students have a variety of drawing tools here to answer any of the questions. Students can save this as a draft or select this check mark here to turn that activity back into the teacher. So I'm just gonna circle this here and select the check mark. And now that will go back out to the journal to show the completed page. And when I go back to activities, that assignment is no longer going to be there. The last box here is the inbox. And this is where a teacher is going to post any messages right here on the class announcements. They may include links or different things here on the announcements page. And here on notifications, so it will have any comments that your teacher has left or feedback. Along with the Seesaw app, there is also a parent app. I'm going to switch screens and now I'm in a different account. For parents, you can get the family app or go to app.seesaw.me on a different device. Sign in with an account and that can sign you into a different place that is the family Seesaw app. And you can look at anything that has been turned in. On the home page, you can look up any activities that have been posted in the journal, comments and like items. And this is where a teacher can communicate with you through the family app and family announcements. I'm going to go back to the student account really quick. Let's say a couple things about notifications. You will see a red bubble here if anytime there's a new activity 
where there's information in the inbox. In here, you will see notifications for all the different classes that the student is enrolled in. Our EdTech website will send you to more information and resources for Seesaw. We do have a Seesaw training that's a little bit more comprehensive that goes over all of the different tools. Now I'm handing this off to Kristen to go over GoGuardian Parent. All right, we're going to quickly go over GoGuardian Parent. It's a new app that was released by APS recently, so it actually tracks all browsing history and allows parents to kind of monitor and filter web website browsing for your student. So it's a great tool along with screen time. So screen time and GoGuardian are your main tools to help in that regard. So I'm going to kick it over to Kristen to go over GoGuardian Parent. Hi, this is how to use GoGuardian, the app for parents. GoGuardian is a tool parents and guardians can use to monitor what their children are doing on their computers and limit the websites they go to or times of day they use the internet. GoGuardian Parent app works on Android and iOS cell phones and can monitor students on laptops and Chromebooks, but not on iPads or MacBooks. The first step is to download and open the application. Go to the Apple App Store or Google Play and download the app to your phone. Once the app has been installed, find the application within the apps list and tap the icon to open it. Once the application has loaded, follow the on-screen prompts to authenticate the application with your email address. Use the primary email that is on file with Synergy. If you need to update your email, log into Parent View and update your account. If you update your email in Parent View, it can take up to 48 hours before it will be active for use with GoGuardian. After successfully entering the email address, a prompt will appear. Please check your email. Click the link in your email to log in. Proceed to check your email and press the link within the email to complete verification. If the link does not work, use the pin provided to complete verification. Next, review terms and conditions. Read the terms and conditions before clicking I accept at the bottom. Now you are ready to explore GoGuardian Parent. If you have more than one child at an APS school, click on their name on the drop-down menu at the top to see their accounts. Click on the Summary View to view a summary of the top five visited domains and Google Suite files. You can also see a count of how many times teachers using GoGuardian Teacher have guided your students' browsing behavior by closing tabs, locking browsers, opening specified tabs, or blocking access to websites. You can see all browsing activity by website logged within the Chrome browser. You can also configure filtering settings for your children. GoGuardian Parent can allow you to enforce which sites your children cannot access while considered out of school. Out of school time is considered from 4.30 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. You can set time limits for when your child is allowed to use the internet by choosing a time limit or setting a daily schedule. You can even pause your student's internet access completely at any time. For more information, please visit www.goguardian.com backslash parent dash app or rebrand.ly backslash at dash home dash resources. Thank you. All right, folks, we've covered a lot of content this evening. What I wanted to go over quickly with you are some web resources that the EdTech team has put together. So the first resource I want to share is our EdTech at Home website. It's part of our educational technology website and has information on different applications and devices that we support here at APS. On the main page here, you'll see Family EdTech webinar video. It'll be embedded here so you can actually rewatch it after the webinar is done in case you want to revisit some of that content. Down below here are the list of resources that I've linked that I'm going to be sharing here in a moment. So you can actually go to those resources um, that I'm going to show you here in just a sec. The first resource that I want to share is called Be Internet Awesome by Google. And it's geared for younger students. And it really is like a game that teaches students to protect themselves online, how to protect themselves online, and also how to set their passwords and be a good digital citizen. The next website is my favorite. It's the Digital Citizenship website. 
It's for parents. It's called Parents Need to Know. If you actually hover over the main menu here, you get tons of content here. Um, I'd like to draw attention to the guides that they have. They have really good guides for certain applications that students use at home. And uh, this is a really good extension to the traditional digital citizenship content that they receive at school. It's kind of an extension of that. So it's a really good resource to use with your students at home. The next website is the National Online Safety website. It's more of the same that you get from Common Sense. You just get some guides, courses, and lesson plans here um, to really kind of enrich the experience of digital citizenship with your student at home. So I'd check that out if you have some time. The next website is basically a cloud training website for students who are interested in certain careers. So if you want to be a business and data analyst or a cybersecurity analyst, you can actually dive into these areas. Um, there's more careers that you can look at as well, but it shows you how to use applications, Google applications for those different types of careers. The next website is our Google Junior Training Series website. Um, one of our Google trainers shared this resource with us. They're basically how-to videos and resources for students on how to use all these different Google applications. The next website isn't really a website or a web page. It's a PDF that we digitized and we wanted to make available to you. So um, you can print it or download it. It's basically a short pro, uh, shortcut and a gesture guide for Chromebooks. So if you have a Chromebook at home, you can use this uh, to learn how to be a little more efficient on your Chromebook. It's a really helpful, quick guide on how to do those things. The next website is a website, um, a Seesaw website for families or parents rather, and uh, it shows you how to access Seesaw, download the app, gain access to Seesaw Parent and also the class app. Um, it's a really good quick start guide for parents and students if you're a Seesaw user at home. I would definitely talk to your teacher too in regards to Seesaw just to make sure that your access is, um, you're, you're getting access the right way. The next website is the Edgenuity K5 website, and this one is really for Edgenuity K5 users. Um, I would really look at the iPad section of that website. That's really important in terms of the older iPads that are out there in the district. There's also this Edgenuity documentation site that has more information on that. The next website is the APS.edu uh, Families Connected website. This has links and shortcuts to a bunch of different department resources that are really important for families at home during this time. And last but not least is the Chrome extension for Google Translate. So if you have multilingual speakers, users um, at home that need to translate full websites into different languages, this is a, an essential tool. And um, you can use this on your Chromebooks and on the Chrome browser on your other devices. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Karn to talk about how to find more resources from our service desk and supports from APS. Thank you. Thanks again, Aaron. So last thing we want to talk about is some basic troubleshooting guides. If you're having problems with your students' classes, first thing that we always recommend is contact the teacher. Give the teacher a chance to hopefully answer your questions, solve any problems. If that doesn't work, then your next step would be to contact your school administration. Talk to the principal, assistant principal, whoever is appropriate for your student. If you are having technology problems, problems with your Chromebook, with your iPad, then you're going to want to use the APS Service Desk. To do that, come here to your web browser and you are going to type in aps.edu slash service desk. When you do that, that's going to automatically take you to this web page where you can say that you're a student or family member. You can put in that student's ID number and tell them what you need support with. Once you have done that, you can tell them what grade your student is in, click next, put a description, and then how you'd like the service desk to contact you, and they will get back to you as soon as they can. Back to you, Aaron. All right, and that really does it for all the content we're gonna to cover tonight. I'm going to bring back in 
our team so we can answer the last few questions here. Um, so we've been collecting some questions in the Q&A document. And um, the first question, I'll let Tina and or Kristen answer that one. Um, I'll probably take it. I'll so one of the questions was, is there a way to see my child's work in the Google Classroom versus trying to go through Parent View? So here's the thing is we're trying to very much not have teachers give out information to parents about signing into Google Classroom. In fact, parents aren't allowed to get into Google Classroom uh, due to COPA, FERPA, all those types of laws to where you don't want to have access to any other students information. So um, if you're not getting any emails, they give a pretty good comprehensive, they've been updating it to give like information about what all of the activities are. Uh, if you haven't gotten an email, ask your child's teacher to send out a Google Classroom parent guardian invite, and that should hopefully get you back into getting those emails that will give you information about those classes. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if that second question is kind of related to this. Um, yeah, it's the same one. Okay. All right. So April, um, I guess this one's for April. What happens if iPads don't update to the most current iOS? So um, in order to get every student a device, we gave out all the iPads that we had in the district. And some of those did include older devices that won't update past 12.4.8. So um, that's as far as they will go in the updated um, software version. Awesome, yeah, so if they are at 12.4.8, I think that's as far as they're gonna go now in the interim, but they should work. Um, there is some intermittent issues with Edgenuity. Uh, we're gonna share the website here in a moment and uh, get that going. So the next question is printing from Chromebooks. I know we had a few people ask about that. Yeah, so printing from Chromebooks is an interesting issue because Chromebooks uses Google Cloud printing. Not all printers are Google Cloud print capable. So the list of available printers is very, very long. Um, but if you submit a question using the Q&A form that we've been sharing in the chat, we can share with you a list of those printers as well as the instructions for how to connect up your Chromebook to Google Cloud print capable printers. Wonderful, thank you, Karn. Um, we got another question too, grades updated in a timely manner, kind of, um, so it's, I guess that's up to the teacher. So you do wanna talk about that, Kristen? Um, yeah, if you're not seeing grades updated on Synergy, talk to your classroom teachers um, and ask them to update them. That's not a technology issue necessarily. <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess there was, there was one question regarding a, teacher, um, I guess, emailing personal emails. So we wanna to try to avoid emailing personal emails as much as possible, just so we have a record of all student uh, interactions. So um, if, if there is a, a weird or email that's being sent or shared that, that somebody's asking you to respond to, I would just avoid that altogether and make sure that you uh, use your, your, your students, teachers, APS email to make communications and contact. Um, so that's kind of best practices. A lot of teachers sometimes have um, forwarding rules going on, or they've used uh, third-party tools to kind of protect their personal data or even their personal phone. So sometimes that's the case, but most of the time it should run through APS channels. 100% um, of the time it should run through APS channels. So um, the next question is add Edgenuity to apps catalog for iPads. So do you want to quickly talk about that, April? Sure. So um, currently there is no app for um, Edgenuity. So that is something that you need to access through the web browser on your iPad. And we also have a great website filled with lots of Edgenuity login um, questions and, and answers and just tips and tricks that we've learned along the way to better serve you with the Edgenuity um, program. Awesome. Um, and that's really it. We haven't seen any other further, any other comments come through. So with that, I think that I'm going to uh, quickly share my screen and I can show you our website. And if somebody has our um, website handy, we can actually add that into the banner below instead of the family question one. Uh, but certainly if you guys have any further questions, you can um, enter the rebrandly link uh, for finding the questions and then continue to ask questions after this webinar is done. 
Uh, so let me share my screen really quickly. And I actually have quite a large screen, so I'm not going to I'm thinking Aaron froze, or maybe something happened, but Aaron's not sharing his screen. So um, <laughs> so I think we're going to try and get the link to our website. Let me look for that really fast. I did put the link in the uh, chat on um, YouTube. So it's the rebrand.ly uh, backslash educational technology. Okay. Thank you. So that is where we can get more resources. I think Aaron's unfroze now. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Intermittent <laughs> Wi-Fi issues. So it was um, doing so well until the very end. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna post the resources here, uh, the, the web link, and it should take you to the rebrandly site that, that we're talking or the rebrandly short link for the web resources. So if you guys visit this website right here. It will um, it will take you to our website. So that website, I'm having trouble sharing my screen right now, or else I'd show you. But this link at the bottom right here will take you directly to our EdTech at Home website. And um, at the top menu, if you uh, hover over EdTech at Home, there's an Edgenuity page, and uh, that page has all the information you need to um, get logged into your iPad. If you have a question, uh, again, fill out the form um, or contact us at edtech at APS.edu. If, uh, if, if nothing else, um, you can do that, and we'll try to get back to you with the answers around logging in with Ingenuity and iPads, which has been uh, uh, quite the adventure. So with that said, we are all done. Thank you guys for your time. Uh, I'll bring Shell on screen one more time just to wave goodbye, and uh, you all have a wonderful evening.